Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, episode number 50. Catherine goes to the Crimea. Yeah, we finally made it to episode 50. When I looked back at my initial outline of where I thought we would be by episode 50, I wasn't even close. I figured we'd be deep into the reign of terror of Joseph Stalin by now, but we'll only be coming close to finishing off Catherine the Great. It really makes me realize how much greater Russian history is than I ever dreamed of. And thanks to all of you for listening to the podcast. It does make it so much more fun for me. Well, on to Catherine. Last episode, we followed the now mid-50-year-old empress as she moves from lover to lover, as well as helping decide the fate of the control of Bavaria. She begins to improve relations between Russia and Austria at the expense of her relationship with her native Prussia. Her son Paul has remarried, and in short order, given Catherine two heirs to the throne. Now with the Crimea under Russian control, Catherine decided to pay the southern territory a visit. But this was no ordinary visit. It wasn't going to be done under shadows like Peter the Great's Grand Embassy. No, it was to be done in a grand style, befitting the empress of the greatest nation in the world. Not only would she travel with Potemkin, of course, but with Joseph II of Austria coming along, with the ambassadors of Austria, France, and Britain joining them. The journey would begin in the midst of a frigid winter on January the 1st, 1787. 164 sledges, little mini homes, would start off with giant bonfires started all along the route to guide the drivers. By February 9th, the entourage reached the city of Kiev, the ancient center of power of Russia. Catherine would wait out the winter there and hold court. Thousands came from all over the world to pay tribute to the empress. As Comte de Ségur, the Frenchman, writes, quote, Our astonished eyes beheld at one and the same time a sumptuous court, a conquering empress, rich and warlike nobles, proud and magnificent princes with great men, merchants with long robes and great beards, officers from every branch of service, the famous Cossacks of the Don, richly dressed in Asiatic style, Tatars who were once the masters of Europe, and now bowed humbly under the yoke of a woman and a Christian, a prince of Georgia, bearing to the foot of Catherine's throne gifts from the Phasis and the Colchis, emissaries from the numerous tribes of Kyrgyz, and lastly, the wild Kalmuks, true image of those Huns of long ago, whose deformity inspired as much terror in Europe as the redoubtable sword of the fierce monarch Attila. Catherine took great care and took all care of the expenses of everyone there. There was nothing that wasn't available for the gathered throngs. The Prince de Ligné, who named Catherine Catherine le Grand, which, if you know your French, is the masculine article le instead of the feminine la, as he praised her as a great man. He had this to say about her and the court at Kiev. One could see that she had been handsome rather than pretty. The majesty of her forehead was tempered by her pleasant eyes and smile. But that forehead told everything. One did not have to be a lavater to read there as in book genius. Justice, judgment, courage, depth, equanimity, gentleness, calm, and determination. The breadth of that forehead proclaimed the spacious compartments within for memory and imagination. One could see that there was room for everything. Her chin was somewhat pointed, but not excessively prominent. Her face was not a regular oval, but it must have been infinitely pleasing, because frankness and gaiety dwelt on her lips. She must have had an air of freshness and a fine bosom. However, she had required this latter only at the expense of her waist, which it had been so slender, it might have broken. But people grow very stout in Russia. 
she was quite all right, and if she had not worn her hair so tightly drawn back, but let it fall a little lower to suit her face, she would have been a great deal better. One did not notice that she was short. She told me slowly that she had been extremely quick-tempered, which was difficult to imagine. Everything about her was measured and methodical. She knew the art of listening, and her presence of mind was so habitual that she appeared to be paying attention even when she was thinking of something else. She did not talk for the sake of talking, but made her people appear to be to their advantage. The Empress had all the good qualities, that is, all the greatness of Louis the Fourteenth. She resembled him in her magnificence, her fetes, her pensions, her purchases, her pomp. She held court better, because there was nothing theatrical or exaggerated about it. She did not demand the external forms of worship. One trembled at the sight of Louis the Fourteenth. One was reassured at the sight of Catherine the Second. Louis was drunk with glory. Catherine sought glory and increased her glory without losing her head. And this was the time when she was seeing all of these people, these people from all over the world, and they had such a presence. This woman was so above everybody else, even though, according to uh, some research, she was actually only about five foot one tall. Now, when the spring came, it was decided to travel from Kiev by boat down the Dnieper River. Seventy boats made the journey, seven of which were grand galleys for the Empress and her guests. The grandness of this trip was incredible. The Imperial Galley had an orchestra on board, as well as having a full dining hall, and each of the bedrooms was as comfortable as can be imagined at the time. It was during this trip that a term was created used to this day, and they called it Potemkin Villages. While the flotilla was cruising down the Dnieper, the ships would stop and visit towns that sprang up out of nowhere. They were oftentimes mere facades with loads of happy Russians. Oh, no poverty, no dirty hovels. Just a picture of beautiful towns all along the river. This fakeness was called a Potemkin village, as it was designed by Grigory Potemkin as a show of how well he was governing this new Russian territory. While the empress may have been conned, few of the foreign diplomats were. The peasants who were used to populate these fake cities were often sent home afterwards with no rewards. Or as the Comte de Langeron said, quote, Once the Empress had passed, all these unfortunates were driven back to their homes. Many died from the consequences of this transplantation. But lest you think that Potemkin just built illusory towns, think again. He built many a grand city like Kherson and Sevastopol, he had increased the population of this region from 200,000 to 800,000 people in a short period of time. At the same time, though, he was squandering money to pay off his debts and to live the high life. The journey continued on land when they reached a part of the Tineper that was unsuitable for the ships. Now, while traveling on the steppes of the Crimea, a vast land, King Joseph II walked outside the Empress's tent, along with the Comte de Ségur, to look out at the vastness of the countryside. They saw a caravan of camels nearby, visible because of the light of the stars at night. Joseph was quoted as saying, What a strange journey! And who would have expected to see me, with Catherine II and the ministers of France and England, wandering in the desert of the Tatars. It is a completely new page of history. Segur responded, It seems to me that it is rather a page out of the Thousand and One Nights, that my name is Jafar, and that I am walking with the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, disguised as was his custom. When they came to the Muslim town of Bak, Sarai, she did something quite brave. Instead of entering the city with a Russian military guard, she allowed 1,200 Tatar horsemen to surround her and guide her in. 
The Prince de Ligny commented to Segur, quote, You must agree, my dear Segur, that it would make quite a stir in Europe if the 1,200 Tatars who surround us took it into their head to gallop off with us to a little nearby port, put our revered Catherine on board ship, along with the powerful Emperor of the Romans, Joseph II, and to take them to Constantinople for the amusement and satisfaction of His Highness Abdul Hamid, sovereign commander of the believers. And there would be absolutely nothing immoral about this trick. They need have no scruples about making off with two monarchs who, in defiance of the law of nations and of every treaty, have just made off with their country, disposed, deposed their prince, and fettered their independence. Now, the reason Catherine felt safe was because she knew that the word of these men was their most important treasure, and she wisely had ruled that their religious freedom would be guaranteed along with their customs and their language. Entering the palace where the Khan of the Tatars once sat, Catherine sat on the, on the throne that once ruled Russia. As Segur states, with all the pride of a sovereign, a woman, and a Christian, she took pleasure in seating herself on the throne of the Tatars, who had once conquered Russia, and who, only a few years before their defeat, were still ravaging Russian provinces. They headed off from there to the newly constructed port city of Sevastopol, which was hopefully the starting point for the recapturing of Constantinople from the Turks. The city was booming with shipbuilding going on everywhere. Segur told Catherine, Madame, by the creation of Sevastopol, you have completed in the south what Peter the Great began in the north. The retinue began their return to St. Petersburg with a stopover at Poltava, where a recreation of the battle between Peter the Great and Charles the Twelfth took place. Joy and pride shone in Catherine's eyes, wrote Segur. One would have thought the blood of Peter the Great flowed in her veins. The Turks were by this time infuriated with the Russians. Taking the Crimea was one thing, but building a navy in Sevastopol was another. It was an obvious threat to the Ottoman Empire, and they would have none of it. The Tarita Peninsula was in the eyes of the Sultan and the Grand Vizier, not a beautiful land of gardens and architecture and agriculture. It was a staging ground for war. Now, you would think that the other European powers should have been on the side of the Christian nation of Russia against the Muslim Turks, but you would have been wrong. There was really, truly some great fear throughout the West that the bigger threat to each country's well-being were the Russians. There had to be a way to stop their expansionist policies. Emissaries from a number of European nations goaded the Turks to war. Catherine called upon Potemkin to get the army and navy prepared, but the man was having personal psychiatric issues going on as well as being flat out tired from all the work he undertook in support of his former lover. Sultan Abdul Hamid, sensing that the Russians were weak, decided to attack the fortified city of Kinburn. Potemkin was in panic mode, wanting Catherine to sign a peace treaty. The Empress would have none of that. General Suvarov counterattacked the Turks and won a major victory over them at the gates of Kimburn. The Turkish losses were staggering. But surprisingly, Potemkin held back Suvarov from pressing his big advantage. Catherine was again furious and told Potemkin to take the fort at Archakov and to reverse his defensive posturing and go on to the offensive, warning him. You are not some little private person who lives and does as he pleases. You belong to the state. You belong to me. By June of 1788, the siege of Ochakov began with heavy bombardment, which weakened the fort considerably. Still, Potemkin held back from a direct assault, as he was really concerned with the well-being of his troops. 
seeing the Russians fully ensconced in their war with the Turks, an old enemy decided that now was the time to strike. Gustavus III of Sweden decided to aim directly at the city of St. Petersburg. Panic ensued throughout the capital city, except for one person, Catherine. She ordered her navy to protect the city by attacking the Swedes near the port of Sveborg, where Gustavus' own officers betrayed him and stopped his advance. To the south, Potemkin finally decided that the time was ripe to make a full-scale assault on Ochakov. He promised his men that they could loot the city of everything if they took it. On December 6, 1788, the assault began. Over 60,000 Turks and 20,000 Russians died in the fighting, which at times was part of just hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was pure butchery, as every Turk found was murdered, with the women being raped at will. Next week, we see that while the Russians were victorious, the wars were not over. Another event was also to shake Catherine to her very core, the French Revolution, which was to haunt her until she died. Now, for this week in Russian history, for the week of May 22nd through the 28th, in 1703, Tsar Peter the Great founds the city of St. Petersburg. In 1799, famous author Alexander Pushkin was born. In 1879, Russia and the United Kingdom signed the Treaty of Gandamak, which established an Afghan state. In 1883, Alexander III is crowned Tsar of Russia and in 1896, Nicholas II becomes Tsar. In 1905, the Battle of Tsushima ends with the destruction of the Russian Baltic Fleet by Admiral Togo Hiachiro and the Imperial Japanese Navy. In 1972, the United States and the Soviet Union signed the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to visit us at the Russian Rulers History Facebook page. Leave a message, make a suggestion, ask a question. And as always, Das Vidanya i Spasiba Bolshoya.